Thank you for coming to see me in the morning so early. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I thought I would start by introducing a little bit of the context of what we're doing. You know, Georgia Tech has a lot of people working in this area of the origin of life and ancient biochemistry. We have two uh, federally funded centers. One is funded by NASA, and, uh, the, and which, which I'm head of that center, and the other one is, is funded by NSF, which uh, Nick Hudd is the director of that center, this guy right here. And uh, so I think we have probably more people working on origin of life at Georgia Tech probably than anywhere in the world. I think we're, we're sort of one of the international centers in this area. Um, and I'm going to talk about the work of a lot of the people here, um, and maybe I'll introduce them at the end. If they're here. Okay, so first I want to talk about something a little uh, foreign to Georgia Tech, which is sort of our ultimate motivation, which has to do with the difference between applied and basic research. So probably most people at Georgia Tech are familiar with um, applied research or, or translational research or whatever you talk about, because I mean that's what engineers really like. They identify some problem like green energy or individual medicine or drug delivery and then they just really go after it and try to solve that problem. And that's, that's actually not at all what we do. In my lab, that's sort of not our philosophy. We do basic research. And so we basically sort of sit, sit around and think about what we find really interesting, and then we work on those problems. And we don't really worry about whether there is an application for them or not. We just sort of do what we find most interesting. And we try to think about what is the most sort of scientifically impactful question we can ask. And we don't worry about whether we can patent it or start a company or make money off of it. So we're not worried about some specific problem. And uh, why would we do this? Why would anybody do this? Because it seems a little bit self-indulgent. But actually, it's really not. If you think about the really big things in our lives, and I've made a list of them, x-rays, NMR, statins, biggest drug on the market, the internet, cisplatin, you could list a lot of drugs here, or even all the technology of molecular biology, polymerases, ligation, restriction enzymes, all the things we use, all of these things come out of basic research. In fact, the idea of basic research really is that if you want to invent the future or you want to do something that is, that you can't imagine, something that is you just have to sort of accept that you can't imagine the future and you're not going to be able to predict it and just do the most important thing that you can, then something good will come out of it. And that's basically how the really big things in science all happen. None of these things, if you would have, you know, Rontgen, when he was working on cathode ray tubes, he had no idea. He could not conceive of what was going to come out of the discovery of x-rays. And, um, and in fact, all of these, if you think about the people working on early NMR, what they were doing and what has happened with magnetic resonance, you know, they, they, had no, they, had no, they could not conceive of, of what they were doing to the world. And that's, that's basically what um, basic research is. And it's a little bit, people don't like it because it, um, you sort of have to accept that you don't know and that you can't predict and that you, and that you can't plan for the future. It, uh, university administrators really don't like it because they like to have programs, you know, nanotechnology or something, and predict the future and hire in some certain area. And they don't like to admit that really they have no idea and that the really big questions in the future are things that they can't imagine. So it's a little bit hard to rationalize this, but, but it's something that I really believe in quite strongly and it's really what motivates us. So I'm saying in the end, don't ask me why I'm doing this. This is why I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, we're not trying to cure cancer. We're not Directly, we're not trying to find drugs. We're just trying to understand really the most fundamental, important problems that we think we can address. So, we're studying the translational system, which is, this is a, an image I got out of Wikipedia, and so it's incorrect. It shows tRNA with thymines instead of uracils. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway. Let me tell you what this is. This is the messenger RNA. This is genetic material. This is our informational polymer. And this is our functional polymer, which is protein. 
And what happens in the ribosome, in the core of the translational system, is information is tra transduced between this kind of polymer and this kind of polymer. And this is not a simple task because generally in biology we have something called direct templating where you have base pairing, where you have direct molecular interactions and you can have a reaction go from that. That's how polymerases work, etc. Okay, this is not direct templating. Okay, this is very indirect, very complicated. There's no molecular recognition between an amino acid and a nucleotide here. Okay, so it's a very indirect recognition process and it's extremely complicated and the machinery that does it is gigantic. Okay, so we have these are charged tRNAs. This is a tRNA. It has an amino acid. So there is a system of enzymes that puts the right amino acid on each tRNA, which has a different anticodon here. Each, so there's specific anticodons. And uh, this, is, this is called the genetic code, this relationship between this amino acid and that anticodon, right? That's the genetic code. So the genetic code is established by a series of proteins that charge these tRNAs. Then the ribosome is sort of what carries out the code. This tRNA interacts with the message and this peptide or polypeptide is synthesized. The sequence of it is dictated by the sequence of the mRNA. So the ribosome is a very sort of strange enzyme in that it doesn't care about the sequence of the message really. It will make any protein, any sequence pretty much. Um, you run any sequence of t mRNA here and it will synthesize a protein uh, with that sequence. And there's two parts of it. This is called the small subunit and the large subunit. And you have this division of labor here. The small subunit does the decoding. So there's an there's a elaborate machinery. This whole thing, actually if it was correct, would be down here in the small subunit. The recognition between the tRNAs and the, M and the mRNA is all down in the small subunit. So that's, that's actually called decoding. And then the other part, which is the chemical catalysis, that happens up here in the large subunit. And that's where this covalent bond, we call this peptidyl transfer, where this amino acid is transferred up to that valine. So we have a valine attached to this alanine. And then there's a translocation where this thing moves over there. Okay, so that's, and, and that's in a separate subunit. And these subunits, if they're not, actually doing translation, if they're not doing this reaction, are separate. They don't interact with each other. They're stable independently of each other. Um, they come together just to do this job, then they fall apart. So if you isolate ribosomes from a cell that's not really doing anything, you'll get the subunits independently of each other. If you isolate ribosomes from a cell that's making a lot of protein, they will be assembled into one of these machines. Okay, so the translation system has a really special place in biology. And I just want to introduce, this is a really amazing letter written by Carl Woese to Francis Crick in 1969. And Carl Woese was just setting up his lab at the University of Illinois. And he's, he's kind of asking Francis Crick for advice, or he's, not really, he's sort of telling him what he's going to do. He's saying, this is the future of my lab, this is my idea of what to do, and he is soliciting Francis Crick's advice um, here. And if you look carefully in this letter, Carl Wolf, it's this is a really amazing letter. I think this is one of the most important sort of things in 20th century science right here, where Carl Wolf says, if we want to understand our knowledge of evolution backwards a long time, and we, we can use this thing called the internal fossil record of, of a cell. And in order to do that, we have to use the translational machinery. And he says, what more ancient lineages are there? The translational machinery is a direct lineal ancestor all the way back. RNA components, if you really want to understand the most ancient things, the most fundamental things in biology, you've got to look at the translational system. And how he knew this, I have no idea. It's really, it's kind of amazing. I think the vast majority of people at this time would have looked at transcription or replication or something like that. But somehow Carl Woos had some deep insight that allowed him to focus on the translational machinery. And so, and this, so, okay, this is, you guys, this is 1969. And then in 19, 
77, he published this PNAS paper in which they basically rewrote the biology textbooks. They discovered the third branch of the tree of life. So basically, modern biology as we know it has a bacterial branch, an, arche uh, an archaeal branch, and a eukaryotic branch. And basically, by studying the translational machinery, Carl Woese and George Fox, who is our current collaborator on this project, were able to understand this. And only the translational machinery has the information that would allow you to, to understand this. So this is, this is really not an accidental discovery. This is something basically they went after this, they had the insight to know how to do it, and they did it. I find this, this is really uh, one of the most amazing stories in science to me. <coughs> okay, but so now we know a lot more obviously than Carl Woese knew. We have this sort of modern science of phylogeny with all the sequencing. And so th there are 60 proteins that are represented by an ortholog in everything alive. And 50 of those are components of the translational machinery. So the transla translation, you could say it's the universal biology. It is the thing in biology that every cell has. If you want to say, what, does, what is this process that defines biology? It's not replication. It's not transcription. It's not metabolism. It's translation. It is the thing that unites all of us with all of our brothers and sisters, meaning all of us, bacteria, eukarya, archaea, everything. We all have these six, 60 proteins. This is the thing that really defines life. <coughs> so let's just look at this to try to understand what this really means. These are two ribosomes. Actually, this is a large subunit from a bacterium in our lab. Bacteria means red, and archaea means blue. Um, I think because the bacterium we use is Thermos thermophilus, and it's hot, and the archaea we use is a halophile, and sodium is blue, or something like that. So anyway, we use that color scheme, red and blue. So these are two ribosomes, one from archaea, one from bacteria. This is a large subunit. And we have superimposed them on top of each other. And my student Chao Wang, who's now graduated and gone on to become a professor in Taiwan, did this incredible, it really seems trivial now, but this superimposition took him about six months because it's a global superimposition of, you know, the molecular weight of this thing is a million and to get this superimposition to work and to be sort of statistically correct and defensible was no small thing. And so this is a global superimposition of these two ribosomes, one from bacteria and one from archaea. And if you look up and zoom up, it's a little busy here, but you can see the difference between bacteria and archaea. See the red and the blue, and you can sort of see the difference. And one thing you can see is the differences are very subtle, right? These, I mean, this is a coarse grain representation, but you can see that the atoms are basically on top of each other here. And if you look up even closer, here, this is what it really looks like in the middle. Okay, the, like I said, the bacterial <coughs> is, is red and the archaeal is blue. So think about this. These are two, these were brother and sister at what we call the last universal common ancestor about four billion years ago. And what we're looking at is the differences over four billion years of evolution. And you can see how much the atoms have moved in that four billion years. And the idea is not very much, okay? This is about, that's maybe a couple hundredths of an angstrom there. And so the sequence, you can sort of see the sequence by the bases. The sequence is essentially the same. Positions of the atoms are the same. This is the RNA in the ribosome. This is part of the ribosomal protein. You can see the ribosomal protein. And one of the things illustrated here is that actually the structure is more conserved than the sequence. So for example, this is a alanine. And this is a proline, and the sequence is different, but the backbone atoms are still on top of each other. So the sequence can vary a little bit, but the structure... So if you want to look really far back in time, you use three-dimensional structure, you don't use sequence, because structure changes more slowly over time than sequence. That's one of the sort of principles of our lab, is <coughs> if we want to understand deep, deep questions going all the way back, we use three-dimensional structures, not sequences. So these things are magnesium ions. So not only is the RNA invariant, over time, the protein is invariant over time, the positions of magnesiums are invariant, and in fact, these magnesiums are hydrated with water molecules, and those water molecules, which I'm not showing, 
they're in the same place. In fact, the water molecules are oriented in the same place, so the hydrogen atoms on the water molecules have not moved between, uh, oh, basically over about four billion years of evolution, these hydrogen atoms are in the same place. So this is one of the most permanent things in the known universe that is not at a very low temperature, probably. I think it's safe to say that. So biology, basically, really doesn't change much at its core. We like to think of, you know, elephants and giraffes and hippopotamuses and all these things and all this diversity in biology, but that's all an illusion, okay? Deep at its core, biology is totally invariant. Nothing happens, nothing changes, okay? And if you want to really see that, you got to look at the translational evolution. There's no such thing as evolution, basically. <laughs> no, that's really not how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> evolution can't touch this, okay? Evolution can't touch translation. It's not allowed. There is evolution, but it's all on the margins. So, really what we're talking about is this. This is something we call the last universal common ancestor. This is where speciation started, okay? We, we broke into these two branches. One of them became Eukarya and Archaea. One of them became bacteria. And we're basically saying, we're comparing this bacterial ribosome with this archaeal ribosome, and we're looking at the differences over about four billion years. And basically, there are no differences. So, what we know is that the modern ribosome, which is the ribosome that everything alive has, was basically done, it was evolutionarily mature at LUCA. All the proteins, all the amino acids, everything we have now we think about is really the core biology, was already done at this point. Everything else up here is kind of a detail. Okay, so how did, this is how we interpret this. We use a computing analogy, which is maybe a little dangerous because biology is not computing, but we say every living cell has ribosomes. All protein is made in ribosomes. The ribosome is transmitted vertically. Now, I didn't really go into that, but one of the ways to think about this is that, okay, we're over here. We got our metabolism through what are called horizontal processes, which is we stole them horizontally from bacteria. So. So, you know, our enolase and these things, we didn't inherit them from our ancestors. We got them horizontally from bacteria, okay? Our translational system we got vertically. We inherited it along this line. We didn't, there's no, there's no horizontal sort of movement of translational components. So there's, there's special rules on, on how things happen with translation which do not apply to other sort of biological components. And the canonical tree of life, in fact, this is what, this is what Carl Wells did. They established this tree of life, and they did this by looking at translational machinery, right? They sh the, the, when we talk about a tree of life like this, you're saying, really, where did your translational machinery come from? That, that's basically what the tree of life is. Where did your ribosomes come from? They came from LUCA through this path. The core of the ribosome is universally conserved. It really doesn't change. And the central core of the ribosome, the deepest part, was established basically at the origin of life and, in fact, is, is even much older than LUCA. So what we say and, is that the ribosome is the operating system of life. It is a thing, it's like DOS. You know, even now when you buy a Windows machine, DOS is still down in there, right? You know it is. They, can, they have never taken it out. And DOS is this invariant thing that can't change because why can, why can Microsoft not change DOS? I, because if they change it, everything breaks. And they, they don't know how to change it because too many things depend on it. Okay, so it really it's a way, one of the ways to think about it is dependencies. There are so many dependencies on a computer operating system that if you change the operating system, the computer crashes. Okay, so translation or the ribosome is the operating system of life. Or you could say it's also maybe the compiler of life. That's another way. You know, you can have your code and your and you're executable and you can you know change your code but if you change the compiler everything goes crazy right so you you can't change your compiler and expect your program to run so you could say the translate the, the the ribosome or the translational system is maybe the operating system of life or the compiler of life and you the problem is there's so many dependencies on that that as soon as you change it everything breaks okay so this explains a lot of things, actually. Once you start thinking about biology, you know, we're all used to thinking about biology in terms of replication, you know, if you think of evolution and replication, and you think about the selfish gene and the little replicators and all of that logic. 
Um, I'm telling you, throw all that away and think about biology in terms of translation. And I'll, it explains a lot of things. So for example, there's this thing called the C-value paradox, which is, look at this. This is the amount of DNA in the nucleus of various organisms. Maybe the biologists are familiar with the C-value paradox or enigma. And this is something that has disturbed people because you have something like there's a, uh, this lungfish. There, and this is, look at this is a log scale. There's a, there, are, there are lung fishes that have like 10 or 100 times more DNA than we do. We like to think of humans or vertebrates as complicated and elaborate. So why does this lung fish need 200 times more DNA than we do? And there are, um, look at this, there's, there's plants. There's, there's some plants that have amazing amount of DNA. So really, what, what is DNA? Why do... In fact, we have way more DNA than it seems like we need. The vast majority of our DNA doesn't make, doesn't do anything we know. I mean, even if, when you look about non-coding RNA and all this stuff, still, the vast majority of our DNA, as far as we know, doesn't, we don't know what it does. So what is all this DNA thing? Look at these protozoa, how much DNA? I mean, just massive, really simple organisms with massive amount of DNA. So. This, this actually really has disturbed biologists, actually, because it kind of, it doesn't fit with what we think about biology. Why is the amount of DNA random? And I'll tell you why, because DNA is spam, basically. It's like trying to understand the internet by looking at the amount of spam you get. And you say, this is an important person because they get a lot of spam, this is an unimportant person because they don't get a lot of spam. And that, obviously, that's not going to get you very far, right? This is spam. That's really what it is. If you want to look at biology and understand it, you have to look at the translational system. Here we have the, okay, so what I have here, this is the phylogenetic tree, and we're on top, you know, that's, you know. Anyway, this is just, this comes out of a computer. You put ribosomal sequences into some code, it calculates distances and makes this tree. We don't bias that in any way. This is just the standard phylogenetic tree of eukarya. And we've mapped a bunch of things on here. The color is the amount of DNA. So look at, and the ones that are way off scale are black. So this is a, a some kind of birch tree here, I think. And this is this lungfish. And um, so the idea is that the amount of DNA doesn't really tell you very much. But the sizes of the circles are the sizes of the ribosomes. Okay, and if you want to look at complexity in biology, the best way or the best proxy is basically to look at the translational system. Okay, and, and systems that have complicated translational systems are complicated. So if you think back to my internet, you know, the translational system is like the IP protocol and all the hardware of the internet. It's the things that really does it. Right? The DNA is just spam that filters through and really most of it is of no consequence. So, that's what this is showing you. DNA is spam. The, the translational system is the hardware, or the, it's, it's the fundamental important part of biology that, in fact, if, if, if somebody say, what does it mean to be human? What, you know what it means to be human? It means to have the largest ribosomes in the known biological world. That's basically what distinguishes us from monkeys, where it's a little bigger. I mean, these are primates up here and things like that. I mean, we all have huge ribosomes. Okay? Because they have to do a lot of complicated things. They have to regulate and deliver and do all, so many roles. I mean, look at, these are bacteria down here in Archaea. Little tiny ribosomes. Okay, so initially I said the ribosome is the same in everything alive, and now I'm showing you that it's different. Okay, I want to just go over you the whole, put this in the proper context. And Jennifer Glass will probably correct me on some details here, hopefully later. But anyway, this is the history, this is our history here. It, uh, so the Earth started, you know, something like four and a half billion years ago, and there was liquid water about, the, the, the Earth was about five billion years ago, there was evidence for liquid water at about four and a half billion years. We have liquid for, we have evidence for liquid water. And life originated sometime around four billion years ago. And, uh, Something kind of bad happened, the late heavy bombardment. There was a time, I think, when geologists and astronomers thought that this was a sterilizing phenomena here, but apparently now they say no. So life could be 
uh, considerably older. Now that they found microbes down in gold mines and really deep down uh, in the earth, it seems like life could have survived this late heavy bombardment. So life could have originated before it. We definitely have microbial fossils at, four and a, at um, three and a half billion years. And so microbes kind of dominated, then, then they basically they transformed the earth by producing oxygen, took away all the iron, oxidized everything, that sort of happened here, uh, 3.8 billion years, something like that. Sorry, about 2.4 billion years ago. Then we got eukaryotes, multicellular organism, animals, dinosaurs. And look, we are not on this. The reason we're not here is because if you put us to scale, we don't even show up on the whole sort of, I calculated, you know, humans are, this is, this is five billion years and humans are maybe a couple hundred thousand years. And if you calculate, it's like, we don't even show up on this thing. So in this history of the earth, the scale, we don't even, we're not even here. Okay, so how do we know all this? We have, a his, we have uh, you know, nature records history. All these craters on the moon are caused by, basically, in a really short period of time, they come from this, the late heavy bombardment. Okay, so the moon hasn't been steadily impacted. These, these impact craters are essentially all in a pretty short period of time, and we have a good record of them. The moon is a really good uh, recording device for things that happened in that time period. So we know about that. And then we have, we have, of course, the sort of mineral record, you know, the biological mineral record, which is fossils. So these are stromatolites. Actually, I there's this guy, Roger Buick, at the University of Washington, and I was actually in his lab, and he let me take pictures of various things he has. So he has these fossils from Australia of stromatolites that are about 3.5 billion years old. And a stromatolite is, this, these are modern stromatolites in Sharks Bay, I think, in Australia. That's what they look like. And they're these uh, kind of, they're these mi weird microbial mats that kind of mineralize. And um, so these are fossils. So this is basically, I think, the earliest fossils we have, some of the earliest fossils we have of biological fossils. And so we know we had basically stromatolite-like structures three and a half billion years ago. There's a good record of that. Um, we can look at the weather and the atmosphere. These are ro some of Roger's fossils of raindrops. This is really amazing, I think. This is a, see this little indentation here? That's a raindrop that struck, there was some volcanic event, so something was laid down, a raindrop struck, and then something else was laid down. So that raindrop, the fossil of that raindrop from, you know, about three billion years ago is preserved. So think about it. This took, you know, a millisecond or something, and Three billion years ago, we still have a record of that. So the sort of the time resolution of some of this is really fantastic um, from the fossil record. And but biology actually does the best for us as far as preserving and maintaining records. And you know you're all familiar with this, I'm sure. But a tree to us, a tree is a really good analogy for what's going on in the ribosome. We, I think of the ribosome really as a tree because a tree records its history in a lot of detail, in a lot of ways. And so if you look at this tree, you know, basically you can see there was some bad years there, right, where the things are small and there were some good years and, and the history of this tree has been recorded. And the tree grows by accretion. Basically once this layer gets laid down and things move beyond it, this doesn't get touched. So this is a really, this is, this is, I'm going to show you this. This is how the ribosome evolves also. There's an accretion process where once something happens, the next layer goes on and that preserves. And so there's this preservation process that goes on. As ribosomes get bigger and bigger, the thing underneath gets frozen. Okay, so a tree, this is, this is frozen. Until the tree gets burned or something, this inner part, this has been accreted and frozen and doesn't change. And it maintains that record. So something happened to this tree here, you know, a car ran into it or something and it remembers, okay? So, <clears throat> so we can read a lot of information out of a tree, and this is basically the, an, a really strong analogy to us between a tree and the ribosome. But, you know, we're used to looking at these things and it's, we look at them so much it's just sort of instinctive to us. But if you look at a tree and you do this automatically, you know what's new and what's old, right? If you look at the tree, the newest things on this tree are the green leaves and then the small branches. So you could walk back, I could say, Make me a map of the age of everything on this tree and you could do it, right? This is the oldest part, then this. Right? You could really, in very detailed way, you could walk through a tree 
and establish sort of relative ages of things in this tree. The ribosome works in exactly the same way. Actually, it is really exactly the same way. Now, you can't do it because you have not looked at ribosomes as much as you have looked at trees. But if you have, I've looked at ribosomes as much as I look at trees. So I can just look at a ribosome and I can read the age of things. Well, Anton and Chad and the people in my lab can do this better than me. But we can just look, tell by looking. I mean, it's really obvious once you're used to it. You can just look at a ribosome and you can read in and say what's old and what's new. It's very simple. One of the easiest ways, and I'll show you this in some detail. This is a bacterial ribosome yeast ribosome, and this is us. We have these really weird sort of uh, octopus-like things coming out of our ribosomes. But because of common ancestry, there is a, essentially there is a bacterial ribosome inside of a yeast. And there is a yeast ribosome inside of us. Okay, It all goes back to common ancestry, but because of this accretion process, basically things got added to yeast, but they didn't touch the underlying thing, okay? And it's really, I mean, this rule is so strong in the ribosome that, that really there truly is a fully functioning bacterial ribosome inside a yeast. And there is truly a fully functioning yeast ribosome inside a human ribosome. So I'll, I'll show you sort of what that means. So this is, these are the same one, bacteria, yeast, and human. So, uh, in the first, just look at that little structure there and that little structure there. I mean, I've changed the scale a bit on these because humans are big and I had to get them on the same scale. But everything here is here. And everything here is here. But there's stuff that gets added on. So, for example, if we look at that little bump right there, it's there and it's there. And if we look at that little bump right there, it's there and it's there. And then you say what's different. I have this little bump here. This is uh, helix 25. And helix 25 is still there in yeast, but it grew. It got bigger. And that yeast thing here is still here, but then it grew and it got bigger. Okay, So this is sort of, in a two-dimensional representation, how this accretion process works. Okay, This helix, I'm going to show you this in three dimensions so you can see what this really looks like, never goes away. Okay, It's always there in everything but it gets added on. And when it gets added on, that never goes away, and then more gets added on to that. So it's just like a tree. The ribosome grows like a tree. So uh, this, is, this is sort of the same thing. And this is human and E. coli. Just sort of showing you in greater detail. Every, everything you see here, you can find here. There's nothing that has been taken away. And I mean nothing. You can. Uh, they're represented a little different. See, this, some stuff got added on in here, but this element here is that element. Look at this. this th we have a long helix here. We have a long helix here. Stuff got added on, but the underlying structure stays the same. Okay, so think about that. What, what this really means, and it's not that yeast did not come from bacteria, right? This actually is because of common ancestry. You know, you have to always think about it like that. But as the ribosome was established and things happened to it, basically the bacterial ribosome, for some reason we don't understand, basically froze at LUCA. Okay? And it really, you can look all over the bacterial world and the ribosome is basically the same. There is no, there is no diversity here. And that essentially applies to archaea too. Then in, in eukarya, fortunately for us, we have a lot of diversity in the ribosomes. There's all kinds of changes that have happened. And, um, and that allows us to see this accretion process. Okay, so let's, let's look at how this works. So this is a bacterial ribosome, which basically is the LUCA ribosome. So this is, we're looking back here at about uh, 4 billion years ago. At, in fact, this is that helix 25. I'm not showing you the whole ribosome. It's that one helix I showed you. And then, wrong way. And then something gets added to it. This is the archaean. It's a little bigger. And so this is the archaean helix 25. Now we have to give it a different name. And then this is yeast. You can see the archaean thing is there and something else has got on. And these are all from crystal structures. This is not made up or modeled or anything. These are from known three-dimensional structures. So what you can see is that things have grown out of the archaean structure, but basically everything is there. And then, so this is yeast. And then we have a fruit fly ribosome. And you can see the yeast all the elements of yeast are there. See how similar they are? Except a lot of things have been added on. 
And then if you look at the next step, we have, a, these are, we have structures of a human ribosome. Everything in fruit fly is there in human, except a lot of stuff has been added on. And, but this, this original helix 25, it's still here, okay? So things, really, it is like a tree. Things get added on, they get added on and added on, but the underlying structure, it's frozen. So this is how we describe this. We say the, the structure and integrity of older RNA components are preserved when you add new RNA. And um, the surface layers are buried and subsumed into a frozen core. And this core is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, you know, I can, I can make a prediction. I'll make a very firm prediction. If we wait two billion years, the eukaryotic ribosome will get bigger, but the underlying core will not change. So, I'll, in fact, I'll bet money on that. <laughs> you have to take a long time to think about these experiments. <clears throat> so, these two things are the same to us. We can, read, we can read sort of the pathway of evolution of this. This is the human ribosome. Okay, and, and, and what this means, though, this is, this is the, this frozen... This, this idea of growing and freezing, what it means is that it's just like the tree where, the, where you, we can look into a tree and we can say, all right, I know what the weather was like in 1925 and 1926. We can do the same thing. We can say, I know what biology was like way back before LUCA, right? Because the ribosome grew by this freezing process all the way from the beginning, okay, from before LUCA. And so we can look deep into the core of the ribosome. So this is the LUCA ribosome. And we can look into this core and we can ask what was happening. Okay, so the ribosome has remembered the history of biology for us. And one of the things we can see, for example, protein. Was there protein in ancient biology? No, there was not. This is a relation of the amount of RNA to the amount of protein. And we just basically add up the number of nucleotides and the amount of amino acids and Say. And so this is, a, this is the history of protein in biology. In the beginning, in the core of the ribosome, there was no protein. And then we got a little bit of protein and we got more and more and more. So basically the ribosome has totally tracked the history of biology. I mean really deep and, and important events, for example, the arrival of protein in biology is frozen into the ribosome. And then we can look at those proteins, I think the next one, and we can say, what were these proteins like? These ancient, like these are the first proteins in biology. What were they? Were they beta sheets or alpha helices? Were they enzymes? What were they? No, they were not. They, were they weren't unstructured, but they were non-canonical. They were non-folded. So this is basically uh, sort of what we would call canonical protein structure. And what you can see, these are normal proteins up here, if you look, you know, the average protein, they're about 60%, 70% alpha helix and beta sheet. These things in the core, basically they had not learned to fold yet. Okay, so th this is protein before it had learned to fold. So what, what does that mean? How does a molecule learn to fold anyway? What we really think is, this really wasn't protein. I mean, it wasn't pure protein. It wasn't the protein. It was a racemate probably. It was... Uh, it was contaminated with esters. It, it wasn't chemically, it hadn't learned to fold yet because it wasn't really refined protein. So, th so this, our interpretation of this is that, you know, not just the arrival of protein, but really the chemistry of the polymers is kind of trapped into the ribosome. And if we can figure out, you know, what kind of polymers fold in this way, we can figure out what the precursors of protein were. That's one of the things we're working on along with Nick Hud. Okay, so, you know, I told you the ribosome was a tree, and, um, and, and I showed you how when we move forward, you know, from bacteria to yeast to fruit fly to human, we can see all these branch points. And I don't really tell you, but we can walk backwards, because once we've done that, we can recognize how it branches. Um, and just like you can look at a tree and you can you don't have to cut the tree down in order to say this branch is older than that branch. You can just tell by looking. I'm not going to tell you how we do it, but it's really well grounded and easy to do. We can look in the, in the core of the ribosome and do the same thing. Okay? So these are all the little 
elements. This is, this is basically a map of how the LUCA ribosome grew. Okay? And um, it's complicated. Uh, Anton and Chad really worked this out. But, you know, there was, there was uh, <sighs> this red thing is older than that green, which is older than that. So, and we can see really distinctively, I'm not going to tell you how we did it because you don't have to do it. I've already done it for you, but it's very easy to read how the ribosome grew. And we can go back into the ribosome and read it backwards into time. Okay? So this is the part that's conserved in everything alive, but we can basically read back and figure out how it grew. And this is, this is a lot of information and it's kind of too detailed. So what we did was we kind of grouped it into these phases. So we have six phases here that um, we grouped these things. And so basically, this is the initial, this is the oldest part of the ribosome here. And then, then this, and then things grew from there. So we, we get, it's like when you look at a tree, you can see that trunk, and you say this is the oldest part of the tree. That's what that is. That's the oldest part of the ribosome, right there. And so what we have done, this is the main experimental part of our lab, so, okay, wait, let me show you. So this, this little section right here, that's this. I've zoomed up into it, okay? So now, this red, I haven't really explained to you how we did that. You're just going to have to believe me. But this red part here, <coughs> this is the oldest part of the ribosome. And that's what it looks like in three dimensions. So this is what we do. We make that, and we bring it back from the dead. And we study it in the lab. And we have all these steps as this thing grew. In fact, we basically have five steps here in order to, to get to, to this structure here. And we've, we've made all of these structures. And we have them, and we're studying. So basically, what we're doing is we're recapitulating the deepest, oldest evolutionary steps in the ribosome. And this, to us, is the origin of life. The, the, the way to think about it, this part of the ribosome is older than protein. It, it comes from before there was protein in biology. It's, it's from some world that we don't even know what it was. Okay? And yet we have it. Because of this accretion process, this freezing process, it got frozen in time for us so we can go back and pull it back out and, and, and look at it and study it. And uh, so we have all these steps. And I mean, we, if you go back, we have a lot, right? This is enough to keep graduate students busy for a very long time, right? We have so many steps in ribosomal evolution. And the nice thing is, you know, we can, it's not that hard to make RNA, right? We order the gene, express it, we can make this piece of RNA. We have all these pieces of RNA. We're studying what they do. We have ideas. This, this here, we believe, this is the exit pore. This has the A site and the P site. And we think this should be the smallest catalytic element right there. But so we make it and we can figure out if that's true. We believe that this thing should be more active in iron than with magnesium because the ancient earth was rich with iron before oxidation. So, you know, we have a lot of predictions. Basically, this we're studying the origin of life, but it's just experimental science like any other kind of science, right? We have, we have models, we make molecules, we test them, and then half the time, more than half the time, we're wrong, and we have to remake them and revise our models. So there's nothing different from this and any other experimental science. Okay, I think with that, I will. You guys are looking bleary-eyed here. Let me just tell you that Jessica, who introduced me, is the manager of uh, our lab, and she has, you know, kind of done a lot of experiments, but also keeps everything um, working for us really well and is technically... You know, she has probably trained more people to do good molecular biology than anyone I know. I mean, just the number of people she has trained and got going is unbelievable. And she's also a really good scientist and does a lot of, has a lot of nice papers. And Anton, I'm not seeing him here. There he is. We have, so we have sort of division of labor. We have a bioinformatics group, that whole um, cutting the ribosome thing is done by Chad and Anton and, and Nick, and, and they basically, we have sort of new bioinformatical tools that we have invented to help us understand the ribosomes. I think we're probably the only people really 
looking at the ribosome in an integrated way. We don't, we, I mean, we want to, we're studying the ribosomes of everything. Most people who study the ribosome are doing like yeast or bacteria or something. We're studying all ribosomes. And it's not easy because, you know, these are molecular weight millions. You know, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of sequences. There's just the amount of data you have. In fact, we call the ribosome the most data-rich volume of space in the known universe. It's, you know, you could, just, just dealing with all the data is um, really daunting. And so these guys have basically developed a whole bunch of new tools. Actually, we, and people all over the world use their tools now for studying the ribosome. Um, and then uh, Chao Long here, he's, he's the one who really got us going. I should always mention him. He helped us write the original proposal and um, did our original experiments and really got the whole project going. Okay, thank you guys. Appreciate you coming. <laughs> Mr. Nathan. And I'll answer questions if you have any. So this is fascinating. We're going to talk more. <laughs> um, so at what, well, okay. So let me ask you this, just as a thought question, since you do a lot of crazy thoughts out there. So I, I worked at the Astrobiology Institute my senior year. In I know you did. Right? He's, yeah. And so they brought up, someone brought up this concept of maybe Earth, our system of before nucleotides evolved in our space, and that's our basis of life. Uh -huh. But on some other planet and some other conditions, maybe it doesn't have to follow that same logic. Right. So do you think that yours are based on like chemical ways that planets form, or do you think it's just specific to Earth in it, order to conjecture? Um, if I had to guess, I would say that RNA, what, this is the way I would say it, RNA is kind of a frozen accident in that if you started life again, you might get a different polymer. But that protein is not. That protein, I think, uh, I think protein is probably, if I had to guess on something being universal to life, I would say protein. The, ma the reason I say that is, number one, amino acids are everywhere in the abiotic world, and nucleosides and nucleotides are not. I think RNA is really a creation of biology, but even though it didn't kind of make sense from what I said, because I'm saying that protein came late, but I think it was much more natural. I think, you know, if you, I mean, amino acids are raining down on our heads right now from outer space. They're just made everywhere, and um, they're very easy to polymerize. And RNA is, uh, you know, it's really not clear where it came from abiotically. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really difficult to understand it. So I think RNA, I didn't say it, is also a creation of biology and that the ribosome, the original ribosome was not necessarily made from RNA. So that's, that's another level of complexity here. Yes. So, Gary. Got a model of the ancient ribosome now that actually makes a bond? Um, yes. Not very well, but yes. We do have our ancestral, we call it our ancestral APTC, which is our, our ancestral peptidyl transferase center. Yes. Um, you know, and we haven't published it and we probably won't for a while because the yields are really low. We can only see the product by mass spec. And, uh, you know, what we would really like to do is get it up and running so we can do kinetics and, you know, that sort of thing. And we're not there yet, for sure. Do you optimize it empirically, or have you got a theory that says, well, what we need to do is keep this position and increase the yield rate for it? Well, we optimize it. In fact, that, the, that last thing I showed, which we call AES 1 through 5, which is on the bottom of that thing, that is our second generation. And, um, we actually have not tested that yet. Um, the assays are not so easy, and uh, you know, if our center is renewed, we'll test it. If it's not, I don't know if I will. So, uh, you know, um, yeah, we we iterate it by, you know, in fact, every year, in fact, even. We can, we can come up with models faster than we can test them. That's our problem. And so we have a working model, we have a reaction, but we have, we now know that's wrong. It's, it's, it's wrong in so many ways, but we, you know, haven't, we can just, it's so slow and so laborious to test them that our actual testing of the models is way behind our models. So, yeah. Could you kind of summarize what we get for having a bigger tree? Like, what is the functionality that we gain as the ribosome? Gets bigger. gets bigger. You know, th that's a really good question. Um, and we don't know totally. And actually, so 
that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. But if you think about a eukaryotic ribosome versus a microbial, you know, you have docking on all these organelles and delivery of proteins and you have a lot more sophisticated regulation. You know, it's thought, you know, the human ribosome or the, the have these octopus arms that come out and those are exactly what those do is not known, but it's thought that they might provide some communication between the exit tunnel and the uh, decoding region. So there's some kind of very long range communication maybe in fluctuations between those things. But that's just not known. But if, just, if you really think about what the ribosome is doing, it's not just making protein. It's regulating and it's delivering and, you know, and ribosomes are transported and, all, you know, there's, there's so many roles it plays. And so all the complexity of a eukaryotic cell gets kind of wrapped up into that ribosome. Yeah. Do we have any models for how these accretion events occur? Yeah, what do you mean? That's what I showed you, isn't it? What do you mean? Oh, you mean chemically how it happens? No, like how do you go, I mean, it looks like, I wasn't sure if it's, for example, a very small sub-angstrom difference between species that accumulates over time through the mass change or the mechanical change. Uh, no, this is what it is. If you look here, this is the first expansion that we know about. And basically, it's like a tree. This is a trunk. This grows out, and in fact, we call this an insertion fingerprint. It's a very specific kind of conformational fingerprint that allows us to identify it. And really, it's, it's unbelievably um, kind of reproducible, is that an arm comes out and then it grabs on. There's something called an A minor interaction here. So an arm sprouts. Actually, we think something, you know, RNA can self-ligate, right? So we think an RNA self-ligated here and grabbed on there. And in fact, if you look over here, we have the same kind of thing and then the A minor interaction is up there. So yeah, we have a really good idea step by step for, and, and even this growth process, you know, you can make self-ligating RNAs. We believe one of the things we're going to try to do is actually put small pieces of RNA together and grow the ribosome, the ancestral ribosome actually in vitro. Because we think actually that's how this grew. It was actually chemically at the, at the level of chemical ligation. And RNA is really good at that kind of thing. Yes? Hey, um, I just have a quick question about the protein folding thing that you mentioned, like a free protein, maybe like functional one. I think mm -hmm. that's what you meant. So what kind of factor do you think that affects a protein of a specific se amino acid sequence that has two different, like completely different, you know, um, structures and then further, I mean, explain it why it has like completely different function because uh, as I, one of your figures shows the percentage of like the beta sheets and the alpha helices, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, do you think like uh, the pre -pro pre functional proteins, what kind of factors impact that? Okay. I mean that. Okay, I think I in the okay. So the function of protein has changed. We think the original what was happening is the ribosome had some very primitive catalytic ability to do non-specific condensation. And some of the products, this is our model, some of the products of that stuck to the ribosome and stabilized it and conferred advantage, okay? So that, that's our model for the uh, origin of protein. So those products of the ribosome stuck to it and they originally did not have to be polypeptide because they weren't making alpha helices and beta sheets. They were just sticking to the ribosome. You mean like serving as a scaffold? Uh, just conferring stability, yeah. I wouldn't know scaffolds. I would say more of a, yeah, they just cooperated with the RNA and the peptide and the RNA together were more chemically stable and, and then, then either separately. So that, that's our idea for the origin of protein, where it comes from. And until, you know, protein is fine as ester. There's nothing wrong with ester until you need to make an alpha helix or a beta sheet and then you cannot do it, okay? So the original products of the ribosome were not making alpha helices and beta sheets. They were just sticking to the ribosome and they're in the, all these whacked out conformations. So, and there's a lot of oxy acids in abiotic systems and so we think probably the original primary product of the ribosome was polyester, not polypeptide. But as soon as you want to form a globular structure, then ester won't do it. So a follow-up on, on Todd's question. So clearly in biology, there's a lot of accretion that occurs, whether it's translation, transcription, replication. Yes. Yet accretion has been conserved in translation, meaning that the last common ancestor is homologous in the three dimensions of life. But it's not homologous for replication and transcription. 
encryption. Right. And yet, the ribosome is so complex in Luca that clearly there must have been replication and transcription at that time. So why did those systems not? Uh, yes. Right. That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer. One of the things we're trying to understand is, yes, wh what, what are the nature of the forces, evolutionary forces on the ribosome that seem to be different than other structures? So what Eric is saying, if you make a phylogenetic tree of DNA polymerases, you, you, don't, you can't trace it back. I mean, there's no signal going all the way back. And so th somehow, you know, there, there presumably was a DNA polymerase or something at LUCA, but it's diverged. Somehow the evolutionary pressure on it is not sufficient to, you know, maintain it to the extent that we can see it all the way back. So what is different about translation? That, I don't know. Well, think about it like this. If, in the limiting sense, if you mess with the translation system, let's say you change the genetic code, you're instantly dead. Right, because that changes every single protein, right? And so, the uh, the I mean, if you just think about it in that limiting sense, the evolutionary pressure on the translation system is just immense because nothing else has that kind of consequence in that limb, right? And I mean, that's the limiting kind of thing. But there's, you know, you're basically evolution does not allow cataclysmic changes, right? You can only do incremental changes, and when you mess with the ribosome. It's just catastrophe. So you, you, it's, it's, so, it's something like that. I'm not really sure, but it's something like that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess my question is kind of related to this. So, but if you, when you talk about the RNA being self-catalyzing and it can do all these things mm -hmm. itself, how does that then get transferred back to the DNA so that it's passed along? Oh, this is before. There was no DNA. We think at this point there was no DNA. There were no polymerases. There, none, none of that. Mm -hmm. There was no coding. In fact, we believe this is the first enzyme in biology. The very first enzyme in biology is this. And so you're asking, yes, what you have to realize, and this is a hard concept, but evolution has evolved. This is from the days of chemical evolution, not biological evolution, right? So, you know, if you think about, about biological evolution where you have genetics and polymerases and all of that stuff, it had to come from something, right? It didn't just up. So there was a chemical evolutionary process that got us to genetics and all of that. That's what got us this. And um, we can talk about that, ideas, but it's, it's a mysterious world that we don't know. But there had to be evolution before genetics because genetics had to come from somewhere, right? It didn't just pop up de novo. So that's a chemical evolution process. Yes? The esterling proteins couldn't form the alpha helices in the beta sheets. Right. Do you see any sort of characteristic or secondary structure for the esterling proteins that's different from well, the proteins? <clears throat> you know what? We haven't made them. I mean, all what we want to do is make. We have ideas for what they are. You know, we think they could be racemates and esters and thiol esters and various things like that. But you know, synthetically to make these things is no joke. And um, so. And that's kind of Nick Hud's world anyway, so it's his job to, to make those for us. But what we would really like to do is make those, some of those molecules. I mean, we can model them and put them in the ribosome and say, you know, in an MD simulation, you know, do they behave in the way we think they should? But then ultimately you need to do the experiment. And that's something that we would like to do, both with the RNA. We believe that <clears throat> actually this was not necessarily RNA. It was a precursor, and we have ideas on what it was. But for right now, experimentally, we just got to stick with RNA because it's easy to make that, and you know. But the ribosome, we believe, is older than RNA and older than proteins. Really, it's it's the core of it was made from their predecessors. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you, guys for coming out with